of this church and a member of the Social Action Committee. And tonight I'm standing in for our co-chair of the Social Action Committee of this church and one of the organizers of this uh, TPP teach-in, Sandy Gonzalez Stratton. And um, I just want to tell you that we're so happy to have you here. And I think some of you have been here before. Our church is so glad to always welcome people who are working for trade justice. And we've been, uh, not trade, only, not only trade justice for social and economic and uh, political justice. And we've been doing this for a long time. And I think that makes this place very special. And you are helping to make that very special tonight. Thank you so much. The structure of the evening is that first Gloria of the Green Party will if, uh, begin, introduce the speakers, begin the whole discussion. There will be a question and answer period. And then the last 20 or 30 minutes, we will have a chance to talk about action based on what we know and have learned. And that will um, last maybe half an hour or so. I, I will tell you when it's around 9 o'clock that, that the formal end is over. But you're welcome also to stay and to talk with each other and organize and, uh, get, and talk about your ideas. Thank you very much and welcome again. Welcome everyone. Uh, and of course, we want to thank the church for, for offering uh, their wonderful space. Uh, and just to say that uh, besides the Green Party of, of Brooklyn, uh, Brooklyn for Peace, and the Park Slope Methodist Church uh, put this together, but there are many, many sponsors uh, who signed on to this really important forum tonight. Um, we're going to talk about a big secret and hope that by the end of this evening there's not such a secret anymore and that we're going to be able to do something about that. Um, I will say in terms of the TPP that if we wanted to address all the issues that it covers um, and that we should be concerned about, we would have no room on this panel. But we are fortunate to have at least three people who can talk about different aspects of it and a little bit of an overview to get things started uh, because we're really talking about something that affects health, affects food, affects the environment, um, finance, labor, many, many, many things. Um, and so if you had any worries or any doubts before that our lives are not our own, that, it, that we're not being controlled by the corporate man behind the curtain, you will really find out today that that unfortunately is true. And so we should be afraid, but when we finish tonight, we should be resolved to take this forward and do more. Um, and we'll talk about those action items. So I'm going to let you know who our speakers are. Um, our first speaker will be Adam Weisman from Global Justice for Animals and the Environment and Trade Justice New York Metro. He'll be followed by Jennifer Flynn. Uh, Managing Director of Health Gap, which is an international AIDS activist organization. Um, and our last speaker will be Gary Goff from the Climate Action Environmental Committee of Brooklyn for Peace, uh, and a longtime labor activist. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, sure, that sounds great. So thank you for coming, everyone. Um, just by a show of hands, how many people in the room before hearing about this forum had heard of the TPP? Wow, that's great. That's really good news. Uh, let the record show for the cameras that almost everyone in the room raised their hands. Um, so you folks are a very rare breed and please congratulate yourselves for being so well informed because there has been a very concerted effort to make sure that as few people as possible have heard of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. It is an effort that involves the active collaboration of our president, who has run TPP with an unprecedented level of secrecy, far exceeding anything seen under the Bush administration, of the corporate media, three of the biggest media corporations, Time Warner, Viacom, and News Corp, the people who own Fox News and the New York Post, are active, are members of the corporate lobbying coalition on behalf of TPP, which, you know, really gives the full lie to Fox's fair and balanced slogan, how can you be lobbying on an issue and expected to report on it fairly at the same time? 
Um, so we are not supposed to know about TPP. And there's a very clear reason why we are not supposed to know about TPP. Ron Kirk, the former U.S. Trade Representative, um, said that it is very, this is a paraphrase, but it's essentially almost what he said, said that um, it is very important that the negotiations not be conducted in public because when trade negotiations um, have released their negotiating text in the past, it has created problems that have made it impossible to complete the negotiations. And what he's talking about uh, are cases like the free trade area of the Americas, which was conducted with far greater transparency uh, in the early 2000s and fell apart because there was massive resistance uh, to this hemispheric trade agreement throughout the Americas. Um, in Mexico, there was a popular referendum. In Brazil, uh, there was a, uh, a level of resistance that went all the way up to the government. The government end up in power. Um, in the United States and Canada, there were massive demonstrations in Miami and Quebec City, and FTA fell apart. Um, similarly, the multilateral agreement on investments, uh, with intense pushback uh, from the 99% fell apart. The World Trade Organization uh, came to a grinding halt uh, at the Battle of Seattle, when uh, a broad cross-section of social movements united in the streets to say no to corporate rule and in the process empowered negotiators from Global South nations to say no to first world hegemony and corporate rule at the expense of the world's poorest people. Um, so they've learned their lesson. And Ron Kirk went on to say, as if the point wasn't clear enough, that the biggest opposition to TPP is not um, the complexity of negotiating between 12 different governments, is not the different conflicting interests of governments, but is domestic opposition right here in the United States. It's people saying, what are you doing? You're giving everything away. That is a direct quote. Um, so our government is very conscious that if the 99% found out what is being done by our government in our name, we would never accept it. Thus, it is our job to make sure that TPP does not remain a secret and that as many people know about this terrible trade agreement as possible before it is too late. And so that's what we're doing here tonight, and that is hopefully what each one of you will do after tonight, spreading the word to everyone you know so that we can grind, uh, drag TPP to a grinding halt, as we have done before with other corporate power grabs. So what is TPP? Um, TPP, it should be understood, it's called a partnership, it's called a trade agreement. Only five chapters of TPP's, um, over two dozen chapters, actually deal with trade. And until Japan was added into this trade agreement, the actual trade impacts of this 12-country uh, deal, which includes the United States, Mexico, Canada, uh, Australia, New Zealand, Singapore, Chile, um, Malaysia, Brunei, Vietnam, Oh gosh, I'm, I know them all, I just don't know if I said them all yet because I don't remember which ones I said. There's 12 of them, Japan. Um, and uh, yeah, before Japan was added into this trade agreement, the countries in this trade agreement fell into one of two categories, countries with tiny economies um, or countries that we already had trade agreements with. So TPP was not really ever, well, it, before Japan was in it at least, about expanding trade. So what is TPP really about? Um, TPP and agreements like it um, are really about pushing the 1% agenda for what they've really always wanted, um, for what they wanted when they passed NAFTA, for what they wanted when they enacted the WTO, for what they wanted um, in the early 20th century when the ruling elites of this country got together um, and tried to stage a coup against our government unsuccessfully. Uh, they went to the wrong guy, Smedley Butler, who was a for uh, the, at the time, the most uh, decorated military man in history um, and wasn't necessarily willing to overthrow the government on behalf of the 1%. Um, okay, pick up the mic, thank you. Um, so, uh, this, is, this is nothing new. It's the latest permutation of the corporations try and the 1% and the trying to rule everything. Uh, trying to circumvent democracy, trying to eliminate um, our power as voters, as citizens, trying to roll back all the gains that we have won over decades of social movement campaigning um, and create a system of global corporate governments that supersedes our national laws, that supersedes our ability to hold corporations accountable, and that puts corporations in charge so that they can maximize our pro their profits at the expense of the public interest and minimize our ability to do anything about it. So. Um, our speakers tonight are going to give you details on some of the different areas um, where 
that are going to be affected as a result. And I'm going to begin by talking about how TPP is going to impact our environment, the safety of our food, um, the welfare of animals, and the human rights of people on the front lines of environmental defense struggles. So I'm going to talk about 10 different areas um, in which TPP um, endangers, uh, is, is really a danger to those concerns. Um, and I'm just going to list them off. Um, the first is government procurement. And this is one of the clear areas where TPP attacks democracy. Um, one of the things that we're able to do as taxpayers, as citizens, as people who have a government that we pay taxes to is have some say into what our government buys. Um, if we want our government to buy locally made products, if we want our government to buy domestically made products, if we want our government to buy environmentally friendly products, um, we can, our government can pass procurement rules, specific government purchasing rules that decide what government can and can't buy. Um, TPP explicitly prohibits these kind of rules. And for the environment, that's terrible news because it means any kind of green purchasing rules, whether that's about uh, recycled content, whether that's about uh, responsible wood sourcing, um, whether that's about really just any manner of uh, environmental regulation that you can think of on pr products the government could buy, can potentially be challenged uh, by a foreign investor in one of the other TPP countries. So we can really, uh, and so when we think about who the countries are involved in TPP and what are some of the environmental stakes, it's very frightening. Some of these are countries that have critical endangered ecosystems, countries like Malaysia and Peru, um, countries with, uh, with, that are bio, have biodiverse habitats that are under attack by a range of extractive industries, um, by logging, by oil, by mining, etc. cetera. Um, one of the biggest and most talked about concerns about TPP is that it follows in the footsteps of NAFTA in including in, uh, investor, what's called investor state dispute resolution. And what that means is that foreign corporations are granted the right to sue our government in international tribunals outside the jurisdiction of our court system where they can demand unlimited sums in compensation for lost potential future profits. Now that's a lot of words, so what does that all mean? Well, let me give you an example of what that means. In El Salvador, there's a company, there's a, um, there's a river called the Rio Lempa. And near the Rio Lempa, there is a mining project that a company called Pacific Rim, which is a Canadian mining company, decided they were going to conduct for gold that was potentially going to permanently contaminate this river that provides 60% of the drinking water for the entire country. There was massive outcry. Um, the government, under public pressure, canceled this mining project. And the mining company, uh, used a which is a Canadian company, used a subsidiary in Nevada to claim to be a U.S. company so that they could sue for damages under the U.S. Central America Free Trade Agreement for $170 million. Now, have they invested $170 million in this mine? No, not even close. They barely invested anything in this mine. Um, but what they were claiming was that they were entitled to compensation for all of the money they might have made in theory, if they'd struck gold and gotten massive amounts of gold and been able to turn it around for $170 million. Uh, that's, how the, that's how this works. Um, and the cases, cases abound. There's one right now in Peru, where the Peruvian government is being sued by a US investor for Peru's audacity in demanding that the, a company responsible for a smelter that is considered one of the 10 most toxic sites on the planet uh, remediate that smelter. The, uh, US, the U.S. company is demanding compensation uh, demand, and for the outrage of being asked to clean up the site that is poisoning communities. Um, case after case, the U.S. Be, being sued by a Canadian company for prohibiting a toxic fuel additive. Canada being sued by a U.S. company for prohibiting a toxic fuel additive. Canada being sued repeatedly by U.S. pesticide manufacturers like Dow for banning toxic pesticide imports. In one case, uh, Canada banned a pesticide that is being phased out globally for being toxic. Now you'd think that if there's a global phase out, you can't sue a country for phasing something out. You'd think that, except that's not apparently how corporations think NAFTA works. Um, so these, this investor state dispute resolution um, has a massive economic cost on countries, attacks environmental laws, leads to environmental policies being overturned, and also leads to environmental laws never being passed. 
because countries fear these massive suits. For a country like the U.S., we can fight these cases out. We can foot the bill. For a country like El Salvador, which is a small and poor country, the economic impact of having to pay out on one of these cases is devastating. Um, and one issue that we should, I think, is uh, near and dear to a lot of our hearts, where this, this investor state dispute resolution process is being used right now, is around fracking. Um, right now, there is a Canadian company that, similar to the mining company, uh, has a dummy operation in the U.S., uh, incorporated in Delaware, where lots of corporations like incorporating, um, that is suing the Canadian government uh, because Quebec banned fracking and claiming that that is a violation of their investor rights. So we can imagine now what's going to happen if New York bans fracking. Um, and that's especially troubling under TPP because Japan is the number one importer of liquid natural gas. So even under NAFTA, we may be at threat from this, but TPP makes the threat even worse. And there's something else that TPP does. Um, we, have a, we have a 1992 policy that circumvents the community approval process for the construction of liquid natural gas export terminals. Well, that is a big concern when we are about to enter a free trade agreement with the largest importer of liquid natural gas. So TPP may be the end of any hope we have of banning fracking in New York and stopping the growth of the environmentally devastating fracking industry. Free trade agreements like TPP, and especially TPP, given the geographic distance of the countries involved, um, are a major threat to efforts to curb climate change for one reason, because they are a total rejection of the idea of buying locally, sourcing locally, consuming local products, in part because of what I mentioned before about a tax on buy local rules, but also because they encourage greater international trade. They encourage, instead of buying products that can be made locally, they encourage the elimination of tariffs on imported goods that make it, that incentivize corporations producing overseas in markets where they can produce more cheaply with lower labor standards, lower environmental rules, and then shipping products back here. Well, that's troubling for two reasons. One, because it means product corporations can circumvent our environmental laws domestically and then sell products to us cheaper than those that are bound by our environmental laws. But it also means that goods are being shipped greater distances, which means a, a greater environmental impact from the fossil fuels being used to ship those goods. And one of the areas where we've seen the effect of, um, on a very devastating level of outsourcing and offshoring production um, because of the elimination of import tariffs is in agriculture. In 1994, when NAFTA was passed, Smithfield Foods, the uh, massive factory pork company, uh, decided to, out, to, to outsource away, offshore pork production uh, to a massive factory farm in Veracruz, Mexico, called Carroll Ranches. Well, this is a company had been, that had been fined for its terrible and toxic practices um, in the Chesapeake Bay, the company that was notorious for terrible pollution in the U.S., but they decided that what they could get away with in the U.S. was not enough. So they moved to Mexico, where they set up a filthy factory farm operation, and you can see pictures of just hogs, uh, dead hogs floating in water, the atrocious uh, factory uh, effluent lagoons that they created, and unsurprisingly, they made an entire community sick. Lots of people got, this factory farm incubated disease, lots of people got sick with this mysterious illness, that spread throughout Mexico and then came north of the border and they called it swine flu. And pretty soon 18,000 people died. Well, the hog industry considered this a major crisis and they needed to immediately respond uh, to this terrible turn of events. They needed to respond to this crisis in the most important way possible, which is to make sure that we started calling the disease H1N1 and not swine flu because it was a public relations disaster. Did they stop outsourcing production? Did they stop factory farming? Of course not. Um, so, um, one of the um, other areas uh, that we, now that we've transitioned to, into food a bit, um, one of the things that we need to be very concerned about, um, we hear these nice words like partnership and free trade that are built into these agreements that are really very high, very sinister things. Another word that we should watch out for is harmonization. Beautiful word, harmonization. Um, is, uh, we were, I was giving this talk uh, in Washington Square Park the other day, and there was a, a group of a cappella singers uh, harmonizing as I was talking about this, which just perfectly illustrated the point. 
I mean, what could be wrong with harmonization? Well, here's another term for harmonization, which is race to the bottom. What this really means is creating a flat line of standards across the board um, for the benefit of corporations so that if uh, any country has higher food safety standards, we basically play whack-a-mole and knock them down to our lower standards. So for example, 160 countries have banned a, a, a livestock drug called ractopamine. And ractopamine um, has been, is, was originally uh, developed as an asthma medication, failed at that, uh, was repurposed as a drug to make livestock leaner. And they found out that it makes livestock very sick, causes lots of animal suffering, makes people who meet, eat the meat of these animals pretty sick. So a lot of countries very sensibly banned it. The US is not one of those countries. So instead of seeing TPP as an opportunity to raise our standards, since President Obama calls this a high standards trade agreement, we did just the opposite. We knocked down everyone else. We're trying to knock down everyone else's standards. Even the countries that are not in this agreement yet, like Taiwan, are having their arms twisted to uh, ban, to lift the ractopamine ban in preparation for maybe being considered for TPP. Japan had their arms twisted to, bet, to lift their regulations on beef from animals uh, over 30 months of age out of concern about mad cow disease. Um, on the flip side, we are going to be under TPP importing a lot more toxic food. We're going to be importing Vietnamese shrimp that is uh, toxic with pesticides, uh, but not increasing our inspection capacity to actually pick out dangerous food. We're going to be importing uh, trans-shipped Chinese uh, shrimp, shrimp via Malaysia, meaning shrimp that Malaysia imports from China and then reshipped uh, re to us. One final area to be concerned about, and particularly going into the future, um, I mentioned before how the extractive industries uh, benefit greatly from these trade agreements, the oil, the gas, the mining uh, industries, the logging industry, um, often at the expense of indigenous communities who fight uh, battles to the death to defend their land, as in Peru where a community was massacred for rising up. Uh, against a land grab facilitated by the U.S.-Peru Free Trade Agreement. Well, another area that we have to be very concerned about with TPP is palm oil. Malaysia is very concerned about TPP. They're talking about carefully studying this agreement before ever entering into it. Well, to sweeten the pot, one of the things that's being talked about with TPP in uh, future negotiations is increasing um, the re re removing barriers to palm oil exports. And palm oil is, an is absolutely environmentally devastating. We are wiping out rainforests around the world, and particularly in Southeast Asia, for the supposedly environmentally friendly biofuel that is actually more environmentally destructive than petroleum. In Southeast Asia, we are wiping out the habitat for orangutans, for pygmy elephants, uh, who are being poisoned for eating the palm fruit, uh, for Malayan tigers, um, in order to, to create these plantations and wipe out some of the most pristine and critical uh, and biodiverse ecosystems on the planet. Um, so, when we hear about TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, we should really think about it as the polluter's power grab. Uh, that's what TPP really is. That's one of the reasons we need to stop it. And um, I'm going to now turn over to some of our other speakers so you can hear about some of the other terrible things about TPP and why we must... Hey everybody, my name is Jennifer Flynn and I'm the managing director of an organization called Health Gap. Thanks so much for all of you for coming out and thank you so much to all the organizers and for the great space. Um, if you would like, there's a sign-up sheet in the back. I hope everybody has signed up. I will send to the, sign to the organizers and then they can send out the, the PowerPoint that I have and also some attachments of things that you can do just so that you know what's about to happen to you. I and I think the other speakers are here to organize you to take further action. You've already taken lots of action probably and you're, you come here which is a lot more and you all raised your hand and said that you heard about the TPP or a lot of you did. So, so you're far ahead of the game from most people in the United States. Health Gap, the organization that I work for, is an international AIDS activist organization. We've been, we're dedicated to eliminating the barriers to HIV medications for the poorest people in the world. Uh, and we've been working on trade and access to medicine since 1999. Um, I'm going to talk a little, I'm going to tell you guys a secret. I was supposed to text someone when I was on. Okay. I'm going to let you guys in on a little secret. 
Uh, we actually can end the AIDS pandemic in the next 30 years. And this is not hyperbolic. This is not, you know, wear a condom and you can end AIDS, or wear a t-shirt, or go on a walk and you can end AIDS. We actually now know that if we get a cohort of people who are HIV positive onto AIDS medications, that it will be almost impossible for them to spread the virus. And if they can't spread the virus, then eventually we bend all curves. Deaths go down, and also new infections go down. And in about 30 years, if we get enough people onto treatment, we can actually see AIDS as something like polio. There'll be a couple thousand cases around the world of people living with AIDS. We'll have more than enough money to provide treatment to them. Um, and there will be no new infections, hopefully. This is real. If you don't believe me, read the cover of The Economist, uh, June 2011. So what do we mean by access to medicines? Uh, access to essential medicines in developing countries is an issue dependent entirely on price. We have medications that can treat AIDS and people don't have access to them just because of the price. You may have heard other reasons like people don't know how to adhere to them in poor countries, there's some supply problems, but don't believe that. There are certainly problems always, but the, the driver is price. Obviously, pharmaceuticals are given a patent, and a patent on brand name drugs uh, are usually way, way, way more than generic medications. A patent basically is a government-issued or a government-conferred monopoly. It usually lasts for about 20 years. A monopoly, as you all know from you know, your basic economics class, equals no competitors and usually equals higher prices. The United States has a long history of limiting access and keeping affordable medicines out of the hands of poor people. So this TPP is not the only example of this, and I'll go through some of it. Um, you know, we hear a lot now about the importance of protecting intellectual property and the importance of protecting the ability for pharmaceutical industries to develop medications and be able to be sure that they'll make enough profit that they can continue to research and develop new, new types of medications that will save lives. Something that you should know, the industry, the pharmaceutical, big pharma, the companies that we know and love, and you know, GlaxoSmithKline, all the companies that we hear about, Pfizer, they are actually very bad at developing new drugs. The vast majority of new drugs for all diseases are developed either at universities or by the government. The universities and the government are pretty bad at marketing them. So they just hand over their patents to pharmaceuticals. So don't believe the hype when you hear that the pharmaceuticals need to be able to make a huge profit, make a killing, because they need to put more money back into research and development. Because in fact, the much poorer uh, you know, public sector is the ones who are making the developments in terms of research. Everybody's agreed that, that we need to, you know, get together and, and do something about solving the AIDS crisis. The United Nations General Assembly is meeting right now, and, uh, you know, the, they're talking about the Millennium Development Goals, which were developed almost 15 years ago. And they've come up with, uh, you know, one of them is providing universal access to HIV medications. The United States signed on to it, all the big rich countries signed on to it. And obviously, we're not there anymore. I mean, we're, we haven't reached that goal yet. Um, and we're not going to by 2015. And so now they're talking about how can they weaken the goal that they agreed to and weaken the Millennium Development Goal. Um, one of the things that I wanted to just say is that, you know, the history of pharmaceuticals, the pharmaceutical industry, in getting the United States government to do its bidding and to stop access to HIV medications is long. So back in the day, uh, you know, when they were able to create something called the World Trade Organization's Agreement on Trade-Related Aspects of Intellectual Property, which is more commonly known as TRIPS. It was adopted in 1995, and it set the international minimum standards for intellectual property rights, uh, including patents. Most developing countries signed on to TRIPS, thanks to pressure from the US government. Uh, and then that was the first time that they actually created or supported patents in their countries. After
after, you know, there were some flexibilities built into that original agreement, and that wasn't enough for pharma, so they created something called TRIPS Plus. They came up with this concept of data exclusivity. So basically what that means for a pharmaceutical is, you know, you have to do a clinical trial. You develop a drug, you have to spend a lot of money and a lot of time to make sure that it works. The data that's discovered as a result of that, pharmaceutical industry said, that's our property. We paid for that, so we're gonna keep it, and that should get a patent. So what happens for the generic producer is, they take a drug, it's the exact same molecular structure, they can make the drug, but they actually can't sell it to anyone because they need to put it through a clinical trial. And the clinical trial is expensive, and it's quite stupid. I mean, just think of it in terms of a generic that we all know. How many people know, you know, Tylenol or acetaminophen? So it would be ridiculous, after 20 years of using Tylenol successfully, for another producer to suddenly put a bottle of acetaminophen out and then start testing it on people. Because we know, we have 20 years of history that we know that it works. And this is the exact same example for AIDS medications, for cancer medications, etc. So they, they, they created this new category of data exclusivity. They also decided that, you know, well, maybe we could just flat out extend our patents. Like, why even pretend it's something else? Like, let's just do patent extensions. So some of these provisions can be up to 20 more years. So now you're talking about 40 years. Um, and they, talk, they also came up with this concept of evergreening, which that's the, the instance that you may have heard of where they change something about the drug very slightly or change what it's used for, and then they get another 20-year patent. So you can talk about having, you're looking at having a 60 or 80-year patent on your drug. Um, so, you know, poor countries pushed back. And they were very confused about whether or not they were allowed to export and import generic medications. So there was something called the Doha Declaration. Bill Clinton actually signed the, you know, supported the Doha Declaration. The Doha Declaration was supposed to affirm that the TRIPS agreement um, should not be interpreted or implemented in a manner that would make uh, generic medications out of reach for poor countries. So the U.S. got pissed off, you know, because pharmaceutical lobby, they have 10,000 lobbyists, by, by the way, working every single day to promote their side and to, to limit, actually, fair trade uh, for generic medications. So 10,000 people compared to probably there's, you know, five people who work full-time on this and maybe occasionally meet with a Congress member, so it's a pretty uphill battle. They're the, you know, they're the second most powerful to the financial industry in terms of lobbying and, and public relations. Um, they, they were upset about that, so they did a bunch of things to undermine this Doha agreement and allow for generics. They came up with this concept of putting countries that develop generic medications onto something called the 301 watch list. And that's a trade watch list. It's the first step before in diplomatic sanctions. So, you know, you think of it like there's countries on there, of course, like Iran or Iraq. That's what that's who you would think we'd put on, the United States would put on the list. But instead, we put countries like India, because India is what we call the pharmacy to the poor. They produce 80% of the world's generic medications. Um, so now, you know, there's been some pushback. You, many of you may have heard, my organization actually started as a result of a South African medicines case. Uh, in 1997, medicines, there was a law passed in South Africa, Medicines and Related Substances Control Act. Um, and the Nelson Mandela realized that the AIDS epidemic in South Africa was so enormous that the majority, the vast majority, of the population, the working population, would die. Uh, and there was actually economic predictors that the entire global economy would become uh, unstable as a result of this because South Africa was considered a, an anchor in, on the continent, et cetera, et cetera. So 39 drug companies sued Nelson Mandela's government. And I just love to think about like going home to your spouse and being like, what'd you do today, honey? Today I sued Nelson Mandela, you know, it's a great <laughs> legacy. Um, but we were able to push back against that. So then there's been some history of pharmaceuticals inserting the stuff into trade agreements, like Adam mentioned. Then that brings us to the Trans-Pacific Partnership. 
And what's so incredible about the TPP is that it is the largest trade agreement, you know, people call it NAFTA on steroids, it's the largest trade agreement actually since the creation of the World Trade Organization. Um, they hope to expand it to every single country that touches the Pacific, is, has been as stated as one of their goals. What it means specifically for access to medicines um, is that it will deny people the right to oppose patents before they're granted. So if you're in a country and you need access to a, to a medicine and you find out that that country is about to issue a patent, but you know that you could get a generic, you can't go and protest the, the government. You can't sue, you can't make a case. Um, it would make clinical data, clinical trial data, uh, corporate property for 12 years automatically. It would allow drug companies to make minor changes to old drugs, this concept of evergreening, and get a new 20-year patent. It would let drug companies, and this one's really incredible, and Adam touched upon it, sue government agencies that set reimbursement rates for public health programs if drug companies don't like them. So again, protecting investors and in issuing investor rights over people's rights. Um, so there are three basic things from the Trans-Pacific Partnership that we know. The access to medicine section was actually one of the ones that was released. Uh, one of the harmful rules is this data exclusivity, just in case you all want to remember. Another one is lowering the bar of patentability. Uh, the, the TPP will allow pharmaceutical companies to extend monopolies regardless of what they've done to change it. Uh, and then the last one is prohibit pre-grant opposition, so not allow people to, to protest before the patent is issued. So now to the point, uh, and I have three minutes. Okay, so now to the point of what you guys can do. The one thing that you can do is you can meet with your Congress member and ask them to oppose the TPP, but also there's this opportunity, which I think people will talk about more, of just opposing fast track, the, the ability for the agreement to be rapidly and without much discussion or debate approved, which is exactly what Obama wants to do. You know, basically get it under the rug, get it under the radar so no one knows about it. You should, and when you meet with a Congress member, if they say, like, we know all about the TPP, we think it's good agreement, you know, we're, we're supporting fair trade, free trade, we think it's a free trade agreement, we're free traders, you know, it's good for our economy. Ask them this question. Have you ever read it? Because they haven't. They have not read it. Only one person has ever seen it. That, well, one Congress member has ever seen it. Actually, how many, like, I forget the number of how many corporate advisors have seen it. 600. 600, 600 right. So there's, so there's a bunch of corporate people have seen it. But one Congress member got to see it. It was, you know, in a room. He couldn't bring any aids. He couldn't photograph it. He couldn't record it. Uh, and, you know, he just had a couple hours with it. And a lot of it was like redacted. And so nobody, none of your Congress members have seen it. It's nobody in New York. So you, none of them have seen it. So that's a great question to throw them off their game. Because, by the way, a lot of the New York representatives are pretty supportive of the TPP, as they have been of other free trade agreements. Um, you can ask your Congress member to sign on to, to a letter that uh, Congress member DeLauro has written. So it's a, it's a letter from Congress members to their leadership to oppose this fast track part. Uh, so they don't even have to get into the technicalities of the TPP, or it doesn't even matter if they care about labor rights or access to medicines. This is just actually to say, let's, not, let's at least debate it. Let's at least put it, you know, shine some light on it and have people discuss it. So let's not fast track it. You could do this. You could organize a teach-in about the TPP. You could hold a rally in front of your Congress member's office. That goes a long way, actually. Get some media attention. Get some of this into the, you know, into the spotlight. I think most people would be incredibly pissed off if they found out that even a Congress member can't read the damn thing. So, you know, we were lucky in terms of H in terms of AIDS activists, we were lucky enough that someone leaked the some of the text to us. But there are thousands more I don't know how many pages how many pages are there? 
you know, maybe, we don't actually know how many pages yeah. there are, of course. So there are lots of pages, and you know, as as Adam pointed out, only a few of them actually deal with trade. Um, there's also right now a push, if anyone's from an organization or is particularly wealthy in the room, uh, to to take out a paid ad welcoming the TPP negotiator, or to take out a paid ad around the TPP. Um, so if you want to do that, you know, email me. Um, it'll be another, the, the second time that we've done this. And also if you want more information in the PowerPoint that I'll send to all of you, there's some, you know, further websites where you can go where all of this is laid out. There's a, a website that is not branded by any one organization that has, you know, lots of materials that you can download, uh, talking points, um, and I think actually some of the stuff is on the back there. So thanks so much for listening. And if you have any questions about access to medicine, or if you want to uh, specifically join the health gap list, please let me know and, and I'll take your name and information and hopefully we'll be doing a lot of work together. So, thank you. Um, okay, just a, a, a house cleaning kind of a thing, procedural thing. I'm going to be talking about free trade agreements a lot and what I have to say. So if I say FTA, you'll understand that that's free trade agreement, uh, not fun travel and adventure. <laughs> um, Jennifer, before I start, Jennifer was talking about the TPP as being the biggest FTA. It covers, at this point, 40% of the world's economy. That's how big it is. Okay, the Trans-Pacific Partnership is the latest in this series of free trade agreements that have come into existence since the late 1980s. The first of these, the U.S.-Canada Free Trade Agreement in 1988, was quickly followed by NAFTA in 1991, and now there are over Somebody tell me if I'm talking too loudly, because I, I have no idea. Okay, somebody tell me. Okay, um, quickly followed by NAFTA in 1991, and now there are more than a dozen multilateral uh, free trade agreements and over 3,000 bilateral FTAs and investment treaties. So we have a lot of historical experience to draw on in terms of analyzing this document that we've only seen a, a few pieces of that have been leaked. It's important to understand that most of these agreements, as Adam was saying, have very little to do with trade, but they have everything to do with economic and political dominance. A quick history lesson. At the end of World War II, the United States and a group of other rich nations created three important international institutions the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, and the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, commonly called GATT. The purpose of these institutions was to manage the world's economy, which they have done ever since the end of World War II, and they've operated very much to the advantage of the rich countries. The IMF and the World Bank lend money, capital, to poor countries, supposedly to help them develop IE industrialize. If uh, these countries can't pay the money back, as often happens, the IMF and World Bank may impose certain conditions or structural adjustments. For example, the debtor nation will be forced to slash public services, privatize major national industries, and allow foreign corporations to exploit its natural resources. Think of what's going on in Greece right now. The General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade was the third institution created then. In 1995, the GATT was restructured as the World Trade Organization, and it took its place alongside the IMF and the World Bank as the manager and arbiter of global financial power by facilitating a series of free trade agreements. Here, I'd like to introduce 
a word that is in common use in the international sphere, but not frequently heard within the United States. That word is neoliberalism. It has nothing to do with liberalism, the social and political liberalism that we're familiar with. It is not at all about liberating people, it's about liberating financial capital. Under neoliberalism, profit becomes the arbiter of all questions, whether they're questions about finance and trade or human rights and, and the environment. Neoliberalism aspires to, and does, deregulate industry, privatize schools, hospitals, utilities, public transportation, and anything else that's run in the people's interest. Shreds the social safety net, smashing organized labor. In international relations, one of the main ways neoliberalism manifests itself is in free trade agreements. That's what we're seeing now with the TPT. Neoliberalism has been embraced by every U.S. president from Reagan on, and it's now the dominant economic philosophy in the world. TPP did not come out of nowhere. Free trade agreements make it easier for companies to move their operations to countries with cheaper labor. And then this flight of jobs overseas puts downward pressure on the wages and conditions of the jobs that remain in the home country. NAFTA resulted in the loss of at least 700,000 jobs in the U.S. It also facilitated the exportation of cheap U.S. corn into Mexico, which resulted in the bankruptcy of over a million Mexican farmers. And NAFTA is not unique. The same economics are at work in every free trade agreement that facilitates offshoring jobs, like, for instance, the TPP. One aspect of the TPP has gotten very little attention, and please pay attention to this, the deregulation of financial institutions, financial markets. Even a limited and inadequate law like Dodd-Frank could be thrown out if it is deemed an unfair barrier to the future income of financial speculators. Think of the chaos that resulted from the meltdown in 2007 and 2008, and then think of that being institutionalized in an international agreement. We've already learned about how free trade agreements can supersede national and local laws, and this is clearly a direct assault on democracy. But it's not the only assault on democracy that's associated with free trade. Let me elaborate. Free trade agreements vastly increase income inequality. And study after study shows the greater the income inequality in the country, the less functional its democracy is. These various studies have all the charts and graphs and statistics to back them up, but basically they say what we already know. Power follows money. The Center for Economic and Policy Research examined the effect free trade had on income distribution. They looked at the United States from 1990 to 2007, a period that covers the early years of the U.S.-Canada Free Trade Agreement and NAFTA. Then they isolated income directly affected by free trade. And here's what they found. Free trade negatively impacted everybody's income except for the top 5%. Their income, uh, their income went up dramatically as a result of free trade. Ergo, more free trade equals more income inequality equals less democracy. Access to information is the lifeblood of democracy. The free trade, uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership will seriously restrict our access to information. 
as Jennifer was talking about, patents are going to be uh, extended. Copyright laws are going to be tightened. There will be no distinction under the TPP between individuals who infringe on copyright for their own use, uh, think photocopying a page from a book or making a, uh, a disc of your favorite songs. No, no distinction between those individuals who infringe on copyrights and corporations who infringe on copyrights or throw out copyrights for profit. Internet intermediaries, Facebook, Twitter, the folks who facilitate your email or uh, website would be liable if any of their users violate copyright laws. Every day, there are 58 million tweets. Over 600 million users use Facebook, and some 300 billion emails are sent. Think of the enormous bureaucracy and cost and the impact involved in all the internet, if all the internet intermediaries have to monitor every communication they handle. The background for this, of course, is we have a federal government that is already gathering massive amounts of information about us. At the same time, protecting its own secrets is among the government's top priorities. This is indeed a world turned upside down. War criminals are free to retire in luxury, while those who expo expose the war crimes may spend the rest of their lives in prison. As Julian Assange said, it's getting to the point where the mark of international distinction and service to humanity is no longer the Nobel Peace Prize, but an espionage indictment from the US Department of Justice. There's a uh, good and interesting article on the Rolling Stone website that talks about the new political prisoners, hackers, leakers, and activists. I recommend you look at it. As with several of the existing multinational agreements, under TPP, corporations will be able to sue national and local governments if they feel, as Adam was saying, that a law or policy may negatively impact their future profits. And who is it that passes judgment on these disputes? The majority of cases are decided by just 15 arbiters, almost all from the United States, Canada, or Europe. Several of them have been board members of multinationals. None of them have been elected or are in any way accountable to the public. Their decisions don't need to correspond to any nation's constitution or law. They only need to reference the particular trade or investment agreement in question. And one last point about democracy. People talk about how the TPP will be undemocratic. It's already undemocratic because it's being negotiated entirely in secret. As a member of Brooklyn for Peace, I can't help but consider the impact of the TPP on, inter on the international situation. While the TPP, will the TPP promote peace or will it create the conditions for war? I believe it does the latter. First, these trade, free trade agreements which promote inequality within and between nations, set up conditions that lead to war. Deregulation of national and local law inevitably leads to environmental degradation. This can and does result in the loss of arable land and potable water. It, it, further, uh, it furthers climate change, bringing on droughts, floods, food shortages, and price increases in, for food. Free trade agreements wreak havoc on national economies through imposed structural adjustment and lead to mass unemployment. In practical terms, this translates to more economic instability, more poverty, and more shortages of the resources necessary for life. Already, there are hundreds of thousands of climate refugees and economic refugees. 
the TPP will inevitably increase those numbers exponentially. The Trans-Pacific Partnership is the economic arm of the United States' Asia pivot. For the first time since World War II, and after a decade of war in the greater Middle East, the United States is no longer the dominant power on the Pacific Rim. So President Obama announced the U.S. would shift the focus of its foreign policy to the Mideast, from the Mideast to Asia. One of the main objectives of the Asian pivot is the containment of China, which has soared economically while the U.S. was tied up in Iraq and Afghanistan. And the Asia pivot has to be understood not just as a political and economic maneuver, it is military as well. As Clausewitz famously said, war is the continuation of politics by other means. And this leads me to my final war-related point, imperialism. Sixty years ago, two economic historians, John Gallagher and Ronald Robinson, published an important paper entitled The Imperialism of Free Trade. In that paper, the authors showed that imperialism is an uninterrupted reality of economic expansion, that imperialism's inner logic remains the same whether it takes the form of annexing colonies or expanding free trade. This is as true today as it was in 1839 when Britain launched the Opium Wars to force China to become a giant market for the British-owned opium factories in colonial industry. <laughs> colonial India. It's worth noting that Britain's rationale for the Opium Wars was free trade. In climate action, we say, stop the war abroad, stop the war at home, stop the war on the planet. I think the Trans-Pacific Partnership is a good example of the connections between these three. We cannot stop any of these three wars unless we stop all of them. Thank you. I want to thank our speakers. Uh, they gave us a lot of information. Um, I was